great to be together and worship together. So we're in this series from the book of 1 John, and we are talking, we've titled this series to come and know. What does it mean for us, each of us, to know Jesus Christ, to come and know him, and then we can invite our friends to come and know him. So, so the way I want to think of that, because I, I like food, and, and right now I think of food quite a bit. Um, how many of you ever like to recommend a restaurant you've never been at before? You ever do that? It's like, is it safe? Not really. It's really not safe to tell someone to go to a restaurant you've never been at, right? Well, it's the same way when we're not walking with God and we're not knowing who He is and we're not living for Him and our life isn't a reflection of Him, it's kind of dangerous for people to want to follow that same path we're on if we say, oh yeah, you've got to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Come and follow Him. And say, well, I don't want to be like you. It's why. So we're going to continue this series, and today we're talking about what does it mean to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ? What does it mean to follow Him? And we're going to be looking at 1 John chapter 2, starting with verse 3 down to verse 11. 1 John, starting with verse 3. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is ahead. All, and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded him. So what does it mean to be a faithful follower of Christ? The first thing for us to think about to know what it means to be a, to be a faithful follower of Christ is what does it mean to know Jesus? That's really the first thing. What does it mean to know him? How many of you here know the President of the United States. Some of you are raising your hands. Those of you that raised your hands, tell me what his favorite food is. What, what is it that keeps him awake at night, other than the Republicans? <laughs> the reality is, is I think there's a lot of us today that are living that have a relationship with God or through Jesus Christ, kind of like we do with the President of the United States. We know of him. We, we would profess to be there. A couple of years ago in the USA News, World News, or something like that, one of those news ma magazines, it said in that magazine in a, in a research study that 87% of the people in the United States of America said they're Christians, and 68% said they believe in heaven and hell. Isn't that ironic? 87% of the people said they're believers, and only 68% of the people said they believe in the heaven and hell. What does it mean to know Jesus? So in this passage, he says, if we, we know that we have come to know him, if we obey his commands, the man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and his truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know, this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. So he's describing what it means to know Jesus. And to know Jesus is to have this relationship with him. So I, Viola, before I ever dated her, I I'd saw her. I had been around her. I knew who she was. I, I, I got to know as much as I could about her. But when I finally called her up and I took her out on a date and I began to date her, I began to understand what she really liked. Like, she didn't like if I ordered a hot dog and she ordered a steak at a restaurant. It doesn't work very good. She, she doesn't like certain kinds of places. I figured that out. There's things that she doesn't like me to do. I figured that out. But I found that out as I got to know her. And it's the same way with Christ. As I get to know him and as I get in that intimate relationship with him, I begin to understand what it means to be a follower of him. And he says the first key in this, he says, is, 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 is part of knowing Jesus is 
means that I'm going to really do what he says. You know, it's not just knowing about him, but knowing him or saying that I'm a part of his family means that I'm going to be obedient to him. So what is obedience? He says in his first, in his first verse, he says, we know that we know him if we keep his commands. What does it mean to be obedient? So, so I have some dogs at home, and I'm kind of kind of like my dog. I think my dogs are pretty special, and I've spent lots of hours with my dogs training them. And, and the other day, some people were there looking at my dogs, and I, I threw a bumper out in the snow, and my dog was running, and the, the bumper's buried in the snow, and the dog looks around and comes back, and I'm like, back. And she turned around, and she run back, and she was sniffing and sniffing, and down in the snow, she went to come up, and she had her face full of snow and her mouth full of snow, and it comes running back, and I'm like, that dog knows how to listen. She's obedient. But, but my dog is just does rote obedience. I tell my dog to do something, and it does it. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, the writer there describes a different kind of obedience, and it's the kind of obedience that God is calling us to. It says this in verse, chapter 5, verse 19. It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And it's describing this attitude of our heart. And the obedience that John is writing about here in 1 John is he's talking about the attitude of our heart. What does it mean? So if I say, I'm going to have to be, be really nice to everybody because Jesus says I'm supposed to be nice to them. <laughs> no, it, it, it comes from the attitude. It's like you can tell when people are faking it, right? When people are like, eh, it's good to see you. And inside they're going, why did you come today? You know? We, we have to work at the attitude, and John is describing it starts with the attitude of our heart, and we're called to be obedient to God by reaching out to people. He says, be obedient. So, so we know that we know him if we keep his commands. What does it mean to keep his commands? What are his commands? Jesus summed it up this way. In Mark 12, he says, the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all the strength. And the second is like the first, to love your neighbor as... Does anybody here like themselves? A few of us do. Some of you maybe struggle with that, but, but for the most part, we like ourselves. And he says, we are called to love each other as we love ourselves. So we care for ourselves. We give ourselves a, a good meal now and then. We give ourselves a, a nice warm place to sleep at night. We give ourselves a house to sleep in. We give ourselves a lot of stuff. And he says, we're to love our neighbor as ourselves, and we're to love God with our whole being. And he says, you know that we are obedient to him and we're a faithful follower when we follow his commands to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and body. Wow, that's a big call, right? Well, we can't get there without him helping us and walking with us and encouraging us. So we've got to spend time in his word and we, we've got to spend time following after what he calls us to. He says this the next. He says, if anyone obeys his word, the love of God is truly made complete in him. So he talks about keeping his commands. He talks about obeying his word or, or, or obeying what he has called us to, the written scripture. And then third thing he says in those first couple of verses, he says, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. In other words, how did Jesus live? Jesus lived with a focusing on serving other people. So when you put all this together, what does it mean to know Jesus? Well, it's more than just saying, yeah, he died on a cross. It's more than just saying uh, he came from heaven and he's going back to heaven. It's more than that, but it's about personalizing it and making it a part of our life. To know Jesus means that when people look at us, they ought to know who we are, right? Oh, yeah. So, so when some people come to visit here and, and my sons are home, I don't know why my daughters, it doesn't work this way so much, but when my sons are home, people will say, they'll say, man, Glenn, your sons look just like you do. That's kind of scary, you know. The thought is, is they might even act like me. That's even more scary. So the, the positive is if they look like me, they act like their mother. The danger is, is the daughters look like their mother. We don't know. We're a little bit nervous about them, especially the youngest one. So, <laughs> so, so to know him means that we have obedience and we're to be a reflection of him. So when people see my sons, they say, oh, that's one of Glenn's boys. You know, someone said that a couple weeks ago when my oldest son was here. They said, wow, he looks just like you, Glenn. And I'm like, you've never met him before, but yeah, he looks like me. Do people, when they see us, do they see Jesus in us because of the way we live our life? And if they should, if they're not, we probably need to make some adjustments and changes. And so he calls us to obedience. 
Obedience becomes our heart's desire. Obedience becomes our desire to live out in a reflection of Him in everything we do. Are we obedient to Him? In Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus called His first disciples, He said this. He said, come and follow me, and I will send you out to be fishers of men. He's describing to them that I want you guys to come and follow me, and I have a task for you to do. And you will find throughout all of Jesus' teachings, or all of Jesus' the times that he speaks, you will find everywhere in there is his commands to his disciples is that there's always a task, and the task is always involving interacting with other people. Jesus never, ever calls us to sit on the recliner and do nothing, ever. Satan does, and, and there's a lot of other people that want to, but, but Jesus' call is always a commission that involves going, doing, and being. And the being is the first call, to be a follower of him, and then to go and do and to interact with people and do that, live that out. And so our responsibility is to obey him, to follow him, to live it out, to change hearts, and to make disciples. To know Jesus means we're spreading the good news. He tells us that we are called to follow Jesus' example. It's a huge task. Jesus did everything that he did with the attitude of being obedient to his father. So in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane with his disciples. He's getting ready to be taken away as a prisoner. He's going to be crucified on a cross. He knows that death is coming. It's imminent. And, and he tells his disciples, he says, won't you come and pray with me for a while? And then he goes off and he tells his disciples to, to stop and pray. And he goes off and he prays this prayer. And he says, Lord, Father, not what I want, but your will be done. He, like, in other words, he's saying, take this cup away from me. I don't want to do this. I don't want to have to go to the cross. I don't want to die. I don't want to be crucified. But, God, it's not what I want. It's what you want, and I will be submissive to you. That's the kind of obedience that God is calling us to through Jesus Christ, is that we live out our obedience saying, God, we're going to do whatever you want us to do. So the question is, is are we obedient disciples of Jesus Christ? Or are we just doing our own thing? Are we just living in a world and we have the label up here that says who we are, but we really don't have it in our heart? We're just walking around. We wear the hat, but we don't have the actions. In Philippians chapter 2, um, verses, chapter 2, verse 6, it says this, or verse 5, it says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. He, he was God. He had everything, but he submitted himself to the will of the Father. Then if you go on down in chapter 2 of Philippians, he says this in verse 12 and 13. He says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. In other words, we allow God to live in us and dwell in us and work in us and to do his work through us that the kingdom of God can grow and be spread. Have we confessed God as our Lord and Savior? Do people see it in us? We are called to know Jesus, and to know him means we are a reflection of who he is. So, so the next part of being a faithful follower of Christ, and what I want us to see from this passage today is, how do we love those around us? How do we love those around us? Does anybody here work with anybody else? Now, this is going to be a real trick question, so you don't have to answer this one out loud because some of you work with family and they're here today. But are your coworkers ever jerks? Some of you are really grinning because you want to turn around and look to see if your family members are looking at you. You, you want to see, you know, it's like, you, you guys are in trouble. <laughs> Brandon's looking at you, though. <laughs> So, so, are they ever jerks? The answer is, I'm sure they are. The people you meet on the road when you're driving, do they ever tick you off? Do they cut you off? Yep. Do they ever travel too close? Yep. I want to slam on the brakes sometimes, you know? Um, there's, a, there's always people around us that don't function in very good ways. And he says, we are called to love them. These people will know you're my disciples when you love them and you reach out to them. How do we do that? How do we love as Christ did? How do we love as Christ did? Well, we know that Christ's love does not mean that everything's okay, but it doesn't stop us from having a relationship with people. So in John chapter 15, he says, I am the vine and you are the branch. Every branch in me that bears much fruit, he will purge so he can bear more fruit. And he says, 
Later in the passage, he says that we are the branches and Christ is in the vine and we're to be connected to him. So if I want to love those around me, I have got to be connected to Christ. I've got to be connected to Christ. You all know what communication is? What's communication? Anybody, what's communication? Okay? Communication is relaying needs or wants to somebody. You know, in, in the last 10 years, ever since Al Gore invented the internet, we, we have lost in our culture more and more all the time what it means to communicate. We have cell phones. We have iPods, iPads. We email. We text. And we don't communicate and then by that virtue, what happens is, is we struggle to understand what it means to communicate with our Father. We forget what it means to talk to our Father. So, so when you have a difficult thing to say to your spouse, do you tell them face-to-face or do you send it to them in a text message? You got horrible clothes in your closet. You, you make terrible food or whatever you may say, oftentimes we don't want to talk to people face to face. And I'm always amazed. Usually when I get a negative message from somebody, it comes in the form of an email or a text message. You know why? It's a whole lot less courage than to talk to somebody face to face. And by that action, we also fail to get in the presence of Christ. And so in John 15, he says, you've got to be connected to me. And being connected to me means we talk and interact with him. And we interact with him saying, wow, God, what's going on? Help me out. I'm struggling today. And, and as Julie talked about in that, before we sang that song, that lighthouse, sometimes we need a lighthouse that we can look at because we feel like we've lost our way or there's so much pain in our life and we're just struggling and we want help. And it, talks, it comes back to we've got to be able to talk to God saying, I need help. I need you to walk with me. I need you to encourage me. I need need some strength. I'm just, I'm struggling today. I'm I'm on the brink of disaster. God, can you help me? And it comes back to communicating. And when we talk to him, we allow him to speak into our life and begin to prune the stuff off that stops us from being able to love those around us. So I can't love people if I'm not connected to Christ. You know why? He is the author of love. And with him being the author of love, he helps me know how I can relate to that person beside me that I work with on the assembly line or that I meet in the street or wherever it is that's not so friendly to be around. And sometimes I'm that person. Sometimes I'm that person that someone needs extra love to love because I'm not in a very good mood or I'm in a bad, in a bad place in my own life. I've got to be connected to Christ. The second thing is is we have to understand that the way we love those around us is to understand that Christ has called us to be an example. We are never operating on our own. So in Matthew chapter 7, he tells us, he says that by your fruits you will know them. And he's describing the the non-Christian people or or those that are teaching heresies and and false prophets. He says the fruits that they have, you're going to know them, which coincidentally then means that by the fruits of those of us that function as Christians and say that we are believers in Jesus Christ, by the fruits that we have, people will know who we are. What kind of fruit do people see from you? What kind of people are people recognizing you to being? Are they saying, ah, there's a peach? Or are they saying, that's an old prune, (laughs) you know? What are people seeing in us? And it happens as we understand that God has called us to live our life as an example. We are not living our life in the vacuum of doing whatever we want, whatever we want, however we want. People are watching us, and we're called to be an example. We're also called, he says, in Ephesians chapter 4, he says, we're called to speak the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love so that we can all grow up into maturity, he says. And what he means by that is is that we're called to speak into each other's lives so we can be an encouragement to each other. It's not just kind of a, oh, do whatever you want. It don't matter. It's okay. That's not the truth. In other words, I would be sinning if I told you that sweet potatoes are good to eat. It's not the truth. Right? Now, we can laugh about something that easy, but here's the deal. In the culture we live in, We have a lot of people that say they have a strong spiritual belief and a belief in what Jesus Christ called us to. And then we tell those around us to say, it's okay, do whatever you want. There's already people, I don't know how many of you here, but but the big thing that's supposed to be coming up now is this uh, shades of gray. 
Dude, it's filled with immorality and all kinds of sinful stuff. And there are people that are setting their schedules up so they can watch something like that. Are you kidding me? We're called to be an example, and we're called to be connected to Christ, and we're called to live our life in a way that reflects Him in all that we say and do, which means we've got to speak the truth in love. I'm not going to watch that show. So last night, my wife said, hey, let's watch a movie. You know, we're at home alone. Um, Brianna was gone. We were just there, and it's like, let's watch a movie. So I, was, I went on Netflix. I'm looking for a movie. It's like, everything I see is like lots of violence, nudity, coarse language. I'm like, there's got to be something on here. It took me forever. I think about as long to watch the movie as to find the movie, to find something that was reasonable, clean, that I would feel like watching. I mean, I always think that, what if someone shows up and peeks in my window? What will they see? And, and the reality is, I've got somebody that's always looking in my window. And he knows. And, and so... I found this movie and we watched it and Viola's like, oh, I'm just going to fall asleep. Well, then it was a good movie and we stayed awake and we watched it. We've got to speak the truth and we've got to understand. The, the fourth thing of loving those around us is we've got to be able to lay down our desires for others. So in verse, chapter, chapter 3, verse 16, he says this. He says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for other brothers. And it means what he's saying there is, is that we've got to be willing to release ourselves from our own desires. Just because we have desires does not mean they're God-ordained and God wants us to live them out. That's part of the sinful nature of us. But we're called to take on who Jesus Christ is and lay down our desires for the sake of bettering others and helping build other people up so we can help them to walk in what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Third thing for us to learn today is what it means to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. And that is being in the world and walking in the light. First Corinthians chapter 3 says that we don't live like the world, but we take every thought captive and release it to God and His working to us. And we, we, we allow Christ to work in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And as we, as we study that passage, we see that He is calling us to live our life for Christ. That He says, he says in there, He says that, that we are to be an example, that it's been written on our hearts and we're to live it out. It always amazes me how much stuff we will post on Facebook that is absolutely horrible. I mean, I've seen, I've seen people put messages on there, uh, pathetic swearing comments, uh, horrible pictures, or links to various things, and then you'll meet them a while later, and they're like, great Christian person, and I wonder why this doesn't mess up. You see, the problem is, is we don't understand that we can be in the world. You can put good stuff on Facebook. You can put good stuff on social media, but you can also do bad stuff. And our world wants us to say, it's kind of like you can hide in the closet and send out all these messages and nobody really equates it to you because it's just, it's just part of your persona. The reality is it's a part of who we are. And God calls us to begin to look at ourselves. Who are we and why do we need to live different? In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, he says, that we're called to renew our minds to be different from the world. He says, we don't just continue to on to be like everybody else. This is what he says. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Be not conformed any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. So let's think about that for a little bit. So be not conformed to the pattern of this world anymore, but be transformed. Dude, our world will not get us to live with different principles than what they have. We have to allow God to do that. That's what he means when he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And he's describing this relationship with God that is awesome. And as we talk to God, he, he tells us when we sin. It doesn't mean we don't have temptations. It doesn't mean that we don't ever sin. But he says, he's calling us to focus on new things, to, to allow our thoughts and our mind and our actions to be captivated by God through Jesus Christ and to live out in a different way. And then when we do that, everything changes. Jesus prayed for his disciples and he prays for us. He wants us to understand that life can be different. So he says this. He says in, in John chapter 17, when he's praying for his disciples, and I believe it's a prayer for us today. He says, I have revealed to you, he's talking to his father now, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were not yours, but you gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you, for I, gave them to, for I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them, 
and they know, or they knew with, the, with certainty that, they, that I came from you, and they believe that you sent me. I pray for them, and I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all, and all that you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them, and I will re- remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name that you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. And he's describing in this prayer, he's saying, God, he says, I want you to protect my people. That's us. You see, the way that we can live our life and live in the world and not be of the world is to recognize that, that God has called us to live for him, and, and he's going to bat on our behalf, and he wants us to release ourselves to his care. We can't do it on our own. We can only do it as he walks with us and empowers us and encourages us. And I would challenge each of us today that, that God calls us to be true to our word and to, to make a statement to the world that we live in that we really do believe it and we're going to live it out. And, and when we mean it, whatever it costs, we're going to do it. So, so as we live that out, it costs us sometimes people to like us. Sometimes people don't like us because we live our faith out right. Sometimes people don't want to be with us because we're living our faith out because it's not with values that they want to have or, or values that they don't want to adopt our values. But when we do that, God honors that and God loves that. And that's what it means to be a faithful follower of Christ. Let's pray. God, I thank you for being here today. And I thank you for your call to each of us. I pray, God, you will just help us as we live our life as faithful followers of yours that that we might be a reflection of you to the whole world. I pray, God, that people will know and understand what it means to be a follower of you and that, that as we live that out, that we might faithfully reflect you in everything we say and do. May your kingdom come in our life, God, and may your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.